So today, the mic theme is about why, what did Jesus' death on the cross do for you and for me? Have you ever thought about what Jesus' death on the cross did for you? First Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22 is a much debated text in interpretation. And while it would be nice to actually resolve each word in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 22. However, it is more important for us to recognize the context of the first Christians reading Peter's letter and apply it to us as Christians in Jesus Christ today. First Christians who were reading Peter's letter were identified in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exile of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Do you know the, uh, where are these places in today? These places uh, in today is Turkey. And the Christians who were reading first uh, Peter's letter were Christians around 60 AD when the Roman persecution of Christians were escalating. First Peter chapter 2 verse 19 describes the situation of Christians in about 60 AD. For it is a commendable thing if being aware of God, a person endures pain while suffering unjust, unjustly. And First Peter chapter 4 verse 1 testifies, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same intention, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has finished with sin. Peter wrote to the churches who were going through very difficult times in his day. This is why 1 Peter and 2 Peter is called the Epistle of Hope and the Epistle of Courage. While we do not experience the first persecution and death of the Roman Empire like the church Peter served in the United States, there are still people in our world today who are facing death for their faith in Jesus Christ. In places like North Korea, or other countries that persecute the Christians. As we approach this first Sunday of Lent, I believe that realizing and applying 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 to 22 that we have just read, to what Jesus' death on the cross did for me and for you is very meaningful as we journey through the 40-day Lenten pilgrimage of faith. So the question, what did Jesus' death on the cross do for us slash do for me? First, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 testifies. Let me read it again. For Christ also suffered for sin once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, you know, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus died for your sins and mine. How did Jesus die for our sins. Christ also died for all sins once for all. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 20 
7 testifies, he did not have to do as the high price did, offering daily sacrifice, first for their own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because he offered himself once for all. The same text, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28 says, In like manner also Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many and will appear a second time to all who look to him without regard to sin to bring salvation. For whom did Jesus die on the cross? Jesus, as the righteous, was made a substitute for the unrighteous, which is us. The prophet Isaiah testifies of Jesus' death in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5. So you see the banner. These banners symbolize Christ's substitute, death for us. Let me read this from the Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 and 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our griefs. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. Amen. Jesus' death on the cross was a death for my sins and for our sins. When Jesus died for my sins, it is biblically called a vicarious, vicarious death. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 45, testifies vicarious death. For the Son of Man did not come to be saved, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So when you and I look at the cross, we should repent, remembering that Jesus died for me in the place where I deserve to die. What was the result of Jesus' death on the cross? 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 continues to say, in order to, in order to bring you to God. The words to bring you to God relate to Romans chapter 5, verse 2. Romans chapter 5, verse 2 says, and by him, Jesus, we have access, we have access into this grace in which we stand by faith and have hope and joy in the glory of God. Through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, we have access to God with boldness. So Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12 says, in him, in Jesus Christ, we have access to God with boldness and confidence through faith in him. So friends, let us be truly thankful that we have access to God through the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. The same question, what has Jesus' death on the cross done for me. Second, first Peter chapter 3 verses 19 and 20, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few that is eight lives were saved through water. First Peter chapter 3 verse 19, the words, he went and made a proclam proclamation to the spirit 
in the prison. This verse is one of the most controversial verses in the entire New Testament. This is because Roman Catholics find the biblical basis for purgatory in this particular verse. You know what the purgatory means. However, we Protestants do not accept the application of purgatory in this passage. As I preparing for today's message, I was struck by how many interpretation, interpretations of this passage there have been throughout the historical Christian tradition. Among modern Bible commentators, William Barclay spends several chapters interpreting in this particular verse. Peter repeats this phrase in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 6. For this is the reason the gospel was proclaimed even to the dead, so that though they have been judged in the flesh as everyone is judged, they might live in the spirit as God does. In our version of the Apostles' Creed, we say that after Jesus' death on the cross, he was buried. Other old, old, old versions of the Apostles' Creed say he descended into hell. There is a difference between Hades, which we interpret, translate hell, but the, there is a difference between Hades and hell. The word Hades is the Old Testament equivalent of Sheol. Hades and Sheol are the place where all the dead go to away the final judgment. For example, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 20 to 23, we read, and the beggar died and was carried up by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And he lifted up his eyes in torments in Hades. And so Abraham afar off and Nazareth in his bosom. Another interpretation of the word, he went and made a proclaim, proclamation to the spirit in prison, is that Jesus' grace extends to the entire universe, the realm of spirit and flesh. So Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19 said that you may be able to comprehend what is the breadth and length and heights and depths that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. As for the words he declared to the spirit in prison, some scholars interpret declared to the spirit in prison as a second chance. To me, it's not correct in light of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 says, Just as man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment. So Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 testifies that we only have one only one chance in this life to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and 
to decide to follow him. So nowhere in the New Testament is to proclaim to the spirit in hell. Rather, it can be interpreted like this. Jesus proclaimed, the spirit in hell, those who are not obedient to Jesus, which is fallen angels, demons, and evil spirits. Jesus proclaimed to those evil spirits the victory of Jesus' cross. So during this Lenten season, as you and I see the cross, let us remember that God's grace extends to us through the cross of Jesus Christ. And the victory of the cross of Jesus Christ over all evil. Let us also be victorious through the cross of Jesus Christ in the difficulties of life. The same question again. What did Jesus' death on the cross do for me? Third, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. And baptism, which, which this prefigured, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Peter applies Noah's Ark to baptism and testifies that baptism is an outward sign of salvation and at the same time a good conscience toward God. The Apostle Paul applies Israel's exodus to the baptism of the entire nation of Israel in the Red Sea. Paul testifies in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Peter testifies that baptism is not just a physical act. Peter also testifies that baptism is not merely an our right of washing away the dirt of the flesh, but also an appeal to God for good conscience. That is to say, those who have been washed from their sins in baptism must have a pledge of good conscience toward God. In church, we celebrate sacraments. Our Protestants recognize only two sacraments. First is baptism, and the other is the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. The word sacraments means a soldier's oath or a soldier's oath of loyalty on entering the army. Our place of good conscience should be a determination to live for God's purposes in mystery, mystical communion with God through Jesus Christ. During this Lent, let us remember that in baptism, we have received the washing of our sins by Jesus Christ. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, let us pledge once again to be loyal and faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Friends, 
What did Jesus Christ do for you by dying on the cross? Let us realize that Jesus died for my sins. Let us remember the loving grace that God offers through the cross of Jesus and the victory of the cross of Jesus over all evil. Let us remember that in baptism, we have been washed from our sins by the blood of Jesus Christ. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, let us pledge to be loyal and faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen.